The Pacers are giving up ground in the standings. Let's look at the key players in their races to the end of the season. Plus the Mavs tonight, the Pacers sign Quentin Jackson and some more looks under the hood at the Pacers offensive struggles all on today's Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Tuesday, y'all, and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI. And today, man, oh man, do we have a lot to get to? I typed down some things I want to talk about, and that led to other things I want to talk about. And there's some other key things that I said I wanted to talk about yesterday in my head, and then didn't because the Pacers had a miserable loss. And we'll cover all of it today. We'll start with standings watch, which yesterday I said, eh, maybe not the time after a crummy loss. And then I thought today, you know what? That's probably the best time to do it to show why every game is so important, so important for the Pacers the rest of the way as it should be for the entire season. We'll talk some Mavs ahead of tonight's game, a chance for the Pacers to bounce back. We'll talk about Quentin Jackson, the newest Pacer on a two-way deal signed earlier on Monday, and another look at some offensive numbers under the hood to kind of get a feel for what is going on with the Pacers who are actually kind of sort of struggling offensively. We got to start with standings watch. So this was the revelation I had today. If you listen to yesterday's show, we talked a little bit about Pacers Spurs and a little bit about the Pelicans game. But when it came to the Spurs game, which had happened just earlier that day, I said, this doesn't feel like the time to dive into standings watch because Pacers just lost to the Spurs. Let's talk about that. We'll get to the standings later. But I actually thought today that would have been the best time to do it, to show why a loss like that is so important because Pacers are fighting for something. They want to make the playoffs. They've made that very clear. A lot of their decisions, though not all of them, have made that pretty clear. And here they sit on March 5th, about a month and 10 days, so 40-ish days left in their season, in eighth in the East, the top playing spot. The Bulls won tonight, which just matters a little bit now. And we'll talk about all this. The key race that everyone, including me, has talked about for the Pacers the rest of the way is the race to get out of the plan in the East. And there are now five teams that I would consider in the mix for that group. It is the New York Knicks. Welcome to this group. The Philadelphia 76ers, the Orlando Magic, the Miami Heat, and of course, as you're listening to this podcast, the Pacers. The Pacers have two more losses than any team in that group. Granted, they have played more games than any team in that group. At 62, the Heat have only played 60, the Magic at 61, the Sixers at 60, and the Knicks at 61. But that extra game does matter when you're calculating the losses. Either way, the Pacers are firmly in eighth. They're a game behind seventh. They're a game and a half behind sixth. And sixth is where they want to be. And they are falling behind in this race. The Heat, eight and two in their last 10. The Magic, eight and two in their last 10 and have won three in a row. The Sixers have won two in a row. They beat the Mavs on the road very recently. The not so hot recently New York Knicks, who are three and seven in their last 10, have entered this conversation. So the Pacers, as it stands, are two and a half out of fourth, right? They are right in the thick of that race, but they're also four and a half ahead of the bulls. They're probably cushy enough. Like I would be pretty surprised. The bulls as it stands right now are 29 and 32. If the bulls finished 500 this season, the Pacers only need seven more wins to do that. They are probably out of the bottom half of the play in already. They've probably already secured that with their play this season, even though they're not playing well of late, obviously, but they've done well enough to be at least in the two life play in group, but they want to be higher than that. They need to win games. They are falling behind in this group with the Heat playing so well and the Magic playing so well. And they only have one more game against both of those teams. So let's talk about some relevant things as they are currently firmly eighth and every game becomes critically important when the margins are this slim. And the reason I thought this was relevant to do today after the Spurs loss is the Pacers now, as I said yesterday, and as I've been tracking now since they lost to the Hornets last month, have six losses against the the five teams with below 30% win percentage this season. Right, the Spurs, the Blazers, the Pistons, the Wizards, and the Hornets. They just have six losses against that group. That leads the NBA. If they were three and three in those games, they'd be fourth in the East right now. Right the second. They'd be fourth in the Eastern Conference. That's how much these margins can matter. And I, I never want to hear again in my life something about a regular season game not mattering when you can hear something like that. Like it's critical. Every single game is absolutely critical for the Pacers the rest of the way if they want to get into the playoffs. And I'm not like breaking any news by saying wins are important and matter, 
But for the Pacers specifically in their current spot, it's a tight race. So the things to add to note since we last talked about the standings and the schedule, and we'll get into the schedule again. One is, if you'll recall, in late December, early February, I did a segment on, hey, here comes an easy stretch of schedule for the Pacers to potentially solidify their spot in the standings, right? They just played at, I think it was either right after they played at Boston, right after they played at New York. I did this where they had one of the easiest five schedules in the league left this season. And that was, and that included a game against Char two games against Charlotte, a game against Houston, a game against Detroit, a game, two games against Toronto and a game against San Antonio. Right. Since then they played the Spurs and lost. They played the Hornets and lost. They played the Raptors and lost in that stretch. So they didn't actually take advantage of the easy games that made their schedule easier. And now they've, gotten off two Charlottes, a Detroit, and a San Antonio from their schedule in that stretch. And now their schedule is in the one of the five hardest, not five hardest, but among the five hardest in the league, currently Tankathon, that just does the teams you play, their winning percentage for the rest of the season. The Pacers have the sixth hardest remaining schedule now in the NBA, which is just bananas and says a lot about where they are this season. They have three more really, really tough ones with Minnesota, OKC, OKC. They also have another Clippers game. The rest are all like you could see the Pacers winning it, and maybe they can win those games too, but their schedule is a lot harder now. Now here's the thing. Many of you probably rolled your eyes and just said, well, they, they've they lost to crappy teams, and they've beaten good teams, and I agree. So maybe it's time to throw out the strength of schedule argument for the Pacers specifically. They can beat anybody. They can lose to anybody. That's fine. I will accept that, and I need to put a hand up and say I should probably stop talking like that because they keep losing to these terrible teams, and that's why they're in eighth instead of fourth, like I said a second ago. But it does and has mattered more for some other teams. You can look at the expanded standings on ESPN. You know, the Pacers are 17 and 17 against teams with winning records and 17 and 11 against teams with below 500 records. 11 losses against teams with below 500 records is tied for the most of any team in the top 11 in the East. The Hawks are the only other team with 11. No one in the playoff picture in the East has 10. Pacers have 11, right? That's been a big black mark on their season. The Heat are 20 and 8 against sub 500 teams. The Magic are 20 and 6. Those teams don't do as well against the best teams as the Pacers have done this season, but they clean up against bad teams. Why is that relevant? Because they have very easy schedules the rest of the season. The Magic have the 28th hardest, so the third easiest schedule. The rest of the way they play the Bucks twice and the Clippers once. And then the best opponent by record they play the rest of the way is the Knicks. And yet they have three more against Charlotte and another Wizards game and another Portland game and another Grizzlies game. Very easy. You know who has an easier schedule than the Magic the rest of the way? The Miami Heat who play one more against Denver, one more against OKC. And then the Cavs are the best record they play all season. They have two more Wizards, three more Pistons, one more Blazers, two more Raptors. That is why the Pacers are, they're basically out of time. They're out of lives. They're out of bad losses. They've been out of them, but now especially so given those teams' strength of schedules and they're both playing well. So I honestly think you could say it's more feasible that they catch the Knicks or the Sixers than either of the Heat or the Magic given the state of the NBA season. Part of that is the recent play of those teams. Like I talked about a second ago, looking at their records, the Sixers, are five and five in their last 10, though they've won their last two, and they're looking a little better of late. Sounds like Embiid's going to return this season, but that's still like three, maybe four weeks away if if the reporting is accurate. Pacers have some time to catch them. That's a two-game gap. The two and a half game gap with the Knicks, who are three and seven in their last 10, and Jalen Brunson just hurt his knee against the Cavs. No reporting on what that injury is, but that does matter. Those two teams have somewhat harder schedules. The Sixers have the 18th hardest left, and the Knicks have the 17th hardest left. They also play each other twice, which means one of those teams will win. One will also lose. So, you know, there's Celtics and the Nuggets and an OKC and a Milwaukee on New York schedule, right? A bunch of those teams on Phillies, and they don't have as many. They still have some, but not as many of the easy ones. Granted, again, all these teams have an easier schedule than the Pacers the rest of the way. But those teams seem more attainable to me now. Than the Florida teams, which was the ones I was tracking more closely at this time. So your update on standings watch is, one, the Pacers are out of lives to me. They're out of easy games. They're firmly in eighth. They're not playing well. They need to get back on track. And now, because some of these teams that have been good and consistent are beating up on the bad teams, and they don't have enough of a gap with injuries to catch these other teams unless they start playing well, like right now. So 
Brunson's injury, something to monitor for the Pacers. Embiid, how long he's out still matters. But the Heat are playing awesome. The Magic are playing good. They both have a joke of a schedule. And that is where we are. The other small thing, this might mean nothing. This is just how I would be thinking if I were running the Pacers. <laughs> if I were in charge of the Pacers, I would like to see the Hawks not make the play-in tournament. That seems like a small, stupid thing. The Pacers have beaten the Hawks twice. If I'm the Pacers and I have a one chance do or die make the playoffs game like if they lose the seven eight game and they're in the final one life game to play the celtics in the first round i want to play a team that is not a good shooting team i want to play a team with lower variance even if it's a good team right the bulls are clearly better than a lot of these other teams they're better but they they aren't as aren't as threatening as a shooting team as the hawks who have trey young right at their peak their offense can be awesome i would like if i'm the pacers to see the nets or raptors catch them because those teams have lower ceilings, even if their floor might be higher. So the Hawks without Trey Young, they've lost two in a row as of me talking, four and six in their last 10, are two and a half up on the Nets and three and a half up on the Raptors. Raptors have obviously pummeled the Pacers a few times this season. But I think if you're the Pacers, you'd still rather play the Nets or Raptors than the Hawks. Even if the Hawks don't, the Hawks could just not make that game. But that's just something I think. I think that I would not want to play a high variance team in the playing tournament at all. I would want to play the Pacers in the playing tournament if I'm anybody else because they could just get hot from 3-1 game, as they've shown to do, and win. But if you're the Pacers and you know you want to have the best possible odds in a one-game sample, I would want to play a team with not a lot of variance. And so keep an eye on the Nets and the Raptors uh, potentially creeping up, although the Nets just had an atrocious... The Nets could be so close to this 10th spot. They just had an atrocious loss to the Grizzlies tonight. Anyway, that's the standing stuff to watch. Pacers, it seems like, are going to be top eight, although... I don't feel as confident about that as I used to. And they need to win and win now. And they need to win games they're not supposed to win and do it now. We will do a standings watch segment probably every week the rest of the way. Uh, there will be six weeks left this NBA season, so five more of these coming. And you can get the latest on all this and how I feel about it and the inverse standings and all sorts of interesting stuff as the Pacers push towards games beyond the regular season, which they've basically secured at least a play in game. Uh, the Nets are currently the first team out of the postseason at 24 and 37. That winning percentage might not even get you to the Pacers current 34 at the end of the year. So we'll see how this all goes. That's not a bright spot or a silver lining. It's just a fact of life. Let's talk about the Mavs. Let's talk about another offensive number I want to talk about. And Quentin Jackson is now an Indiana Pacer. Who is he? Why did they do this? We'll talk about all that coming right up in just a second here on the Locked On Pacers podcast. This next segment is brought to us by our sponsor, BetterHelp. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off of our chest, big or small. Certain things can really start to get to you. It is important to let that out, especially to someone who's unbiased on your life. So today, I want to say how I really feel about something. You might even be thinking about the same thing this week. I want to say the Kelly Olenek might have just signed the first contract that could be traded into the mid-level exception. Somebody was DMing me about this today. Kelly Olenek signed a contract extension with the Raptors. And I can't wait to see how the mid-level exception being tradable next season really changes the league. Uh, there'll be a lot of guys who fit in that. Aaron Neesmith of the Pacers could, although trading him away would be silly for the Pacers. Gets me excited to think about the mid-level exception being something that could be tradable. Therapy can be something that can help you with identifying topics that make you upset, sad, excited, whatever. And it can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems or bigger fish to fry than thinking about contractual things in the NBA or our favorite sports team. It's important to get things off your chest every once in a while. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockdownNBA to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockdownNBA. And thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day. For your second listen, check out Locked On Raptors. If you just heard that ad, I talked about Kelly Olenek and his contract extension with the Raptors. Sean Woodley will have more on that. A very interesting one uh, for the Raptors to do. That makes their trade deadline look a little bit better. Let's keep going. Pacers. Let's talk about the transaction they made on Monday. And their team is set. They have their 18 guys. They still can make moves this season. They have two extension eligible players. They could decide to use their roster spots a different way in theory, but they have 18 now. Yesterday, if you listened, uh, if you didn't, I'll explain again briefly. They promoted Kendall Brown. He was on a two-way contract. He's now on a three-year standard deal with the Pacers. So the last two years of that are non-guaranteed. Uh, 
So they did that because today, for me, yesterday for you, March 4th, is the final day teams can sign a player to a two-way contract. So the Pacers used their roster spot to promote a two-way guy ahead of that deadline so they could then sign a two-way guy and backfill that. Apparently, and clearly by their actions, they did not feel like any of the options on the free agent market were good enough to get a roster spot for them or would have helped them more than anyone on their team. I agree, as I've said many times. So Kendall Brown gets the standard contract. He's the Pacers' 15th player. And their new two-way goes to Quentin Jackson, if you haven't heard of him. He is a second-year player in the league. He played for the Wizards last year on a two-way deal. He was playing for the Windy City Bulls this season. Uh, he was in training camp for the Bulls. Played really well in the preseason, actually, but didn't get their last roster spot. Actually, Terry Taylor, the a former Pacer, did. But Quentin Jackson now comes to the Pacers. He averaged 6.2 points, 1.7 assists per game for the Wizards last year in those nine games. His NBA debut, actually, against the Pacers, six foot five scoring point guard ish type, pretty athletic, pretty glidey. I only watched one game, but I've seen him in person play. Uh, so interesting player. He worked out for the Pacers in 2022. It's a one year two way agreement. So he'll be a free agent in the summer, although perhaps the Pacers look to bring him back. Um, so the deadline today was the key thing here. Now they, well, now I guess it's F, it's the fifth for me talking. Uh, now they can't sign any two ways the rest of the year. So Quentin Jackson. Oscar Shibwe and Isaiah Wong will close out the season as two ways for the Pacers. Kendall Brown is now playoff eligible for the Pacers. He gets their last stuff or their last uh, roster spot and he gets money for it. Good for him. Uh, so Quentin Jackson, congrats to him. He's a new Pacer. He is, by the way, this works is players on two way deals are eligible to play in 50 out of 82 games for their NBA team. And then if you're signed later in the season, that number gets prorated down Pacers with 20 games left. So the percentage of 50 out of 82 means he can play in 12 games for the Pacers, whenever the Mad Ant season ends, perhaps he could just be with the Pacers the rest of the way. We'll see how that shakes out. He obviously has a lot to learn. I don't think you'll see Quentin Jackson playing for the Pacers much, if at all, this entire season. But good player for the Mad Ants to have, especially if they're losing Kendall Brown uh, for much more time now. Going forward, he's 25. He can score. He's a big guard. I'll be curious to see what he looks like. But that's why the Pacers signed a player. Don't expect him to have much of an impact. He literally can't even play in eight games. For the NBA team, and now their team is full. They've got 15 standard guys and three two-way guys. They can waive anyone if they want to sign a free agent who is out there for some reason. But again, it would take a lot of injuries for that to be their best path forward. Let's also, in this segment, talk about an offensive number. Let's look under the hood more at the Pacers' recently struggling offense. Again, like I said, their offense, the last two games, 207 total points, their lowest of the season, right? And there's some pace elements to that that make it not the perfect stat ever, but still last four games, Pacers assist percentage, 59.9%. That might just sound like a nothing number to you. I understand that. Usually the Pacers are among the best teams in the league here, closer to like 67% of their made shots are assisted. The top teams in the league, Pacers sixth, Nuggets, champions, Jokic moving the ball fifth, Jazz really have a free moving, move the ball offense are in fourth. The Warriors with Steph move the ball well are in third. The Raptors move the ball well are in second. And Greg Popovich's team is in first. They move the ball. The Pacers move the ball well. They have not been doing that at all in these last four games where their offense has looked really clunky, dating back to that Toronto game that they played at home. That 59.9 assist percentage is 24th in the league. They're not passing it as well as they were when they're playing well. And I think that's obvious if you've been watching the team, but that number really like made it make sense that the ball just ain't popping, right? Some of this goes stuff back to what we talked about yesterday, which to me was, look, the Pacers' identity and engine and the reason their offense has been so good is Tyrese Halburn. When Tyrese Halburn isn't playing well, the Pacers' offense tends to struggle like it did in late December for a stretch before the Pacers got really hot all of a sudden, right? But it was really struggling for that time until they figured some stuff out. They're taking some lumps. They're working him in off the ball a little bit, trying to figure out how he could be a better shooter. But remember what we just talked about with the standing stuff. They don't have a lot of time to work through that kind of stuff. They need to win. They need to be better. And some of that assist percentage thing beyond how Burton struggles is just missing generated chances, right? They missed a lot of threes against the Spurs if you watch that game. They missed some good looks, although they just got their butt kicked against the Pelicans. We're all watching the games, right? It's not just missing. It's not just missing open shots. It's not just Halliburton struggles. They just look worse, right? They just do. It, we all have eyes. We can see it. To me, the thing that has like felt worse or felt different is paint pressure. How much you're actually getting into the paint. Their numbers don't totally support that. So maybe I'm off here, and maybe it's how they're getting the paint pressure or the cloggedness of the lane, right? But that's why I think McConnell has felt so good, and he played awesome, obviously, and made shots. 
against the Spurs, but also got the defense moving and was really valuable. Pacers about the same level of drives per game they usually get. But if you look at those drives and what they're doing with them, that's where the changes are, right? Usually they're a very high pass percentage team. Usually they're really tossing it around, top five, top four, whatever. They're much farther down on that list in their last four games, right? They're still passing a good amount. They're a high passing volume team, but the actual ratio of them has dipped quite a bit compared to how much they're shooting or just trying to get up a shot. So that, is, and their ranking in the league is lower as well. So that's kind of it to me, right? Is that they're just, they're, the lane is kind of more clogged maybe. The passing lanes aren't as obvious. They're just not in sync with, you know, drive, rotate, kick, move, whatever it may be. That's got to, that will be what gets the ball popping to me. Some paint pressure that actually generates a good look at the rim or for a shooter somewhere else. Maybe that they don't have enough spacing because they don't have Shepard. They don't have McDermott. They're traded away healed. May, and maybe it's the lanes clogged because they just played against, you know, Victor Wembanyama and then a good defensive team in the Raptors and a really good defensive team. And, you know, the, the Pelicans twice, right? The Pelicans are sixth in defense. Raptors are huge. Although their defense isn't terrific in Toronto. Uh, and of course, Victor Wembanyama is Victor Wembanyama. So maybe it'll just look good against the maps. And this will all sound stupid. But to me, to get the ball popping, they've got to get paint pressure. Be paint to great, as Jenny Busick likes to say. Get the ball moving around. Drive into the lane. Throw it to a shooter. And actually, of course, make the freaking shots. Maybe that's too lazy. Maybe that's too obvious. We'll see. Let's talk some Mavs. Pacers opponent tonight. Pacers crushed these guys a few weeks ago. Mavs not playing well right now. Pacers, like I said, need to take advantage. The standings dictate wins must come now. We will close out looking at tonight's Pacers opponent, the Dallas Mavericks. But first, we're going to talk about the lovely folks over at FanDuel. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning Five dollar bet, one hundred and fifty bucks. That's a lot, and that's one hundred and fifty bucks if your bet wins. Any winning five dollar bet, you can bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with things like exclusive props that only FanDuel can give you. Quick bets, boom, nice and speedy. Live same game parlays, everybody's favorite. Get in on the action while you're sitting there, and plenty more on FanDuel. Just visit FanDuel.com/lockedon to get that offer. One hundred and fifty bucks in bonus bets with a winning five dollar bet. Shoot your shot on FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NBA. And we are back here on Locked On Pacers. Thanks for making us your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. Check out Locked On Mavs. Here from Nick Angstead about the struggling of late Dallas Mavericks, who are 6-4 and four in their last 10, but have lost two in a row and are clinging to 8th in the West. One game ahead now of the Lakers, who had a nice win tonight over the Thunder. For ninth, ninth, the Mavericks, who were playing super well until the Pacers knocked him off kilter on that road trip. Let's talk some Mavs. It's going to be an interesting game. Uh, a key highlight note to me about the Mavs is they are defending like terribly recently, just horrible. Uh, and they shouldn't be this bad. I don't think the Mavs are a good defensive team per se. In fact, on the season, their defensive rating is like 22nd. But in their last like five, six games, it's near the bottom of the league. It's been one of the worst defenses. In fact, in the last five games, it's been by far the worst defense. It's not even close in the NBA. This belongs to the Dallas Mavericks. And you can look back at the Pacers beating them uh, a few weeks ago. Turner was amazing. If you don't remember that game, he had 33 points. Uh, they scored, Pacers scored 133 that night, which seems like an eon ago that they could score that many points. That is the only time, if you go back one month, right, to the 5th of February. It's the only time the Pacers scored 130 since that game they played against the Rockets literally a month ago, right? So to me, it's revealing that the Mavs defense was the one the Pacers were able to puncture so much. And they need, this could be the perfect game for them to get some offensive mojo back. A team that has been bad on defense recently. The Pacers have not been good enough to, to get any benefit of any doubt. I'm not saying they will score a lot. But they recently did, and they can beat the Mavs. They beat them on the road last year. They really can. I think they can, and they need to. They need to slow down the non-guards, right? That is what stands out to me, remembering back that first Dallas game defensively. Luka was pretty good, right? 33 points on 21 shots. He got to the foul line a lot. He had six assists. His defense wasn't great, but 33, 6-6 six and six is a pretty good game. Kyrie Irving, 29 on 22 shots. He made threes. He got to the line. 
Those two are incredible, right? It takes a lot of teamwork to slow down that pairing. If they both play, that will be the biggest hurdle for the Pacers. Can they stop those guys? That's priority number one. But, but Derek Lively only played 14 and a half minutes. He really struggled with Miles Turner defensively, although his length was still impressive. He played a good game, right? He couldn't play that much for the Mavs. PJ Washington, one for six. They held him in check. Tim Hardaway, who's usually a reliable weapon-ish for the Mavs, he's kind of inconsistent. His defense hasn't been good, but he was four for 12 for the Mavs. Maxi Kleba was one for three for the Mavs. Like, they did a lot of good stuff. They shot it well from three. That's what they do. They're one of the best shooting teams in the league. But the Pacers did well to limit the non-stars for the Mavs. Their highest score, not named Luka or Kyrie, was Josh Green with 14. That's how I think the Pacers can win this game again is, yeah, of course, if Luka scores 70 like he did against the Hawks that one time, of course, you're going to lose. But you try your best to limit him and and do absolutely everything you can to not let anybody else get going. It's not easy. It's not possible to limit Luka Doncic. It's not possible to limit Kyrie Irving. But make it work. Make them work for it and absolutely do not let someone else be the one who beats you. That's what I think about the Mavs because they ISO a lot. That's a good. They should. That style works for them. It works for their best player. But it does make it easier to play that style of slow everybody else down. It always sounds so good to say, oh, let LeBron do his thing and slow down the rest of the Lakers. That's not easy. LeBron's a good passer. He can manipulate stuff. Luka's a good passer too, but he does it in a different way than all these other guys. It makes that a more feasible strategy to me against the Mavs and other teams, even though the Mavs are really good and Luka is unbelievable. Luka not getting enough buzz in the MVP discussions, even though I don't think he should win. I think he should be discussed more in MVP talk. The other thing about the Mavs is the Pacers have to win the front court battle. They did last time. Miles Turner was incredible, 33-8, and eight, one of his best games of the season. Derek Lively could not figure out the inside-out game of him. Siakam played pretty well. He was good on the glass. Matherin started the three. He had an all-around game, right, 11 rebounds, five assists. That front court battle is going to be really important again. The Mavs have a good front court. It's not as good as the Pacers' front court. That has to be an advance for the Pacers again because the Mavs love threes, and they love keeping possession of the ball. They don't turn it over that much, or they try not to. And they're a great shooting team, like I referred to earlier. If you're the Pacers, and you know they're going to get possessions, right? They they got possessions last time they played the Pacers. You're going to shoot well. They shot 45% from three in Gamebridge. But the Pacers still won because they didn't let that turnover thing happen. They forced 15 of them. They dominated the glass, right? They were plus eight on the glass, so they had more chances. They finished well themselves. They dominated the front court. These are repeatable things. They're not super easy because Luka Doncic is amazing, but they are repeatable things against a team that isn't that good on the glass and doesn't have the firepower all the time. They are inconsistent on the offensive end, even with Luka's brunt. This is a winnable game for the Pacers. They've had a dreadful road trip. They need to close it well. I think this is a pretty important game for the Pacers from a morale standpoint, from a, a record standpoint. You heard standings watch at the beginning. And there are things the Mavs aren't good at that the Pacers can exploit, as we saw just a few weeks ago, but they're still really freaking good. And Luka can just have one of those nights that makes it. So everything I just said is totally pointless and useless. I'm looking forward to seeing how this one turns out, how the Pacers do, how the Mavs do. And you know, we'll be talking about it here tomorrow on the Lockdown Pacers podcast with plenty more to come. We'll talk Pacers Mavs. We'll talk plenty more about the state of the team. If they play well, what they did better. If not, what can they do better? Do they need to make some changes? Uh-oh, that's generally the hard word to say. But hey, when you lose, if they lose this one, four or five, that is a conversation that has to happen, even though I think sometimes people really overdo it with the, does this team need to make changes conversation if the Pacers at their point in the season lose again and lose pathetically? Maybe so. We'll see. We'll talk about it tomorrow if we need to, and we'll talk Pacers Mavs, and we'll talk Timberwolves on Thursday, and we'll have a guest on Thursday's show as well. So lots of good stuff coming here on the Lockdown Pacers podcast. Hope you guys enjoyed today's show and learned something and learned how critical every game is and figured out what teams you need to track every night. When you check the NBA scores, if you have questions, I'm on Twitter at Tony R. East, and this show is at Lockdown Pacers. Thank you all for listening. Have a wonderful day, and we will see you soon.